Today on Comic Storian, we're going to look at the dark alternate realities of the Marvel Universe. An evil Iron Man, Spider-Man, Blade, Wasp, and Black Bolt. This is The Dark Hold. And this is Comic Storian, where I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down. I cut out a lot of the fluff and side stories and I tell you the bare bones of what is happening. A story like today's story will allow you to go out and buy all of these issues yourself, supporting the comic book industry and getting more context and some amazing art. You can get this at your local comic book store or digital retailer. All alterations to the panels, text, and images are to prevent copyright problems and all art is owned by its respective companies. Today we're going to be doing a weird mini-series that came out around Halloween 2021. It's called Dark Hold. And the basic concept is five of your favorite superheroes are dragged into a battle with Cthulhu, which is basically Marvel's version of Cthulhu, and they get to see their alternate madnesses, their alternate worlds where they were driven crazy by the things that happened. That's pretty much all the setup you need for this. Scarlet Witch and Doom are involved. Scarlet Witch at one point was possessed by Cthulhu, so she wants revenge, and Doom just wants power. So here we go. Darkhold, the full story. Down in Abyssia, deep below the United States, a crew of robots are digging. They work tirelessly until there's a clink, and then another. And beneath the shovel lies a book bound in chains, the Cthon Scrolls, the original flesh-bound Book of Sins. And right now, it is in the hands of its rightful owner. Cthone would bring forth destruction upon the world the likes that none had ever seen or could ever imagine. But as the Scarlet Witch awakens from the nightmare of what could be, she feels it. She feels as though someone has found the book. Cthone is coming. Back in Abysmia, a robot reads the book and his head bursts into flames when Doom's Herald, Victorious, closes it. Doom tells her that the book was written long ago by the elder god Cthon, on the flesh of his brother, and for doing so he was banished to the other realm. The gods filled Cthon's book with wards against him, but later the pages were copied to stone and then parchment, and now they are known as the Darkhold. A copy of a copy for protection. All who read the true Darkhold will go mad. Suddenly there's a light and a voice tells Victorious that she should have known what she'd find when she heard the book's call. They can't control the true Darkhold. Only the Scarlet Witch can. And as the Scarlet Witch attacks, Victorious lashes out, shouting that she knows her. Doom rejected her love, and she came here for what? Vengeance? Spite? She was never fit to stand by Doom's side. Scarlet Witch is pushed back, but then uses her magic to subdue Victorious, telling her she is here because she knows Victor and her seeking power out of greed. But then there's a sudden whirl of a machine and a bright red light flashes to green as Doom makes his grand entrance, telling Scarlet Witch, there is much you believe, yet you still not know Doom. In taking the book, I alone take the key to Cthone's freedom. Scarlet Witch yells, even reading the first page would drive any living creature mad. It's too dangerous, Victor. Doom says surely she does not think that he would share such an honor. He read through the eyes of his Doom bots the instant the book was found. Any living creature would be driven mad, yes, any creature, but Doom! Scarlet Witch shows an image of her nightmare telling him that this is what Cthon is, what's coming, pure madness, a psychokinetic cataclysm, unless they stop it. Doom tells her that her pleas are meaningless, that he too has suffered visions as of late, and Doom agrees. The two then comb through the book looking for a means to keep Cthulhu at bay and stumble upon a story of the Darkhold Defenders. Five warriors who once drove Cthulhu back into his other realm prison. The dreamer, the fool, the stoic, the hunter, and the artist. They defeated Cthulhu for a time, but entering the other realm cost them their sanity. Doom goes on stating that once, five were needed to exploit Cthulhu's weaknesses, but those five aspects all now rest in Doom. Without telling the Scarlet Witch, he takes the Dark Hole to the machine and activates it, opening a portal, with Scarlet Witch yelling for him to wait. If they're going to stop Cthulhu, they need to do it together. But within seconds, Doom is gone. Scarlet Witch knew that she would have to put together a modern day team to battle Cthulhu at that moment. So she gathered Iron Man, the Dreamer, Blade, the Hunter, Wasp, the Artist, Black Bolt, the Stoic, and Spider-Man, the Fool. The five were summoned to this land, and Spider-Man looks around asking, Did we all just get magic booped again? Wasp then says that she knows a cattle call when she sees one. 
They wouldn't have been brought here unless it was important. What is going on? Scarlet Witch tells him that the situation is dire. She had hoped that this day would never come. One of her personal devils is knocking at Earth's door. Cthulhu is rising again in his strongest form yet. His complete form, and that is why they are all here. Cthulhu has always needed vessels like her until today, when the true Darkhold was unearthed, and boom, what's more? Doom raced to the battle in the other realm, and Cthulhu has chewed him up and taken Earth as revenge. They cannot simply cross over to the other realm either. They must read just enough to temper themselves with madness, as just being in the other realm will drive them mad. If they read too much of the Darkhold, their sanity will be lost. They will be risking their minds to protect Earth. Wasp says that if she's working with Doom after all they've been through, then it's not even a question she'll help. One by one, the other heroes all agreed except Black Bolt. As he doesn't speak, he uses his hands to convey the message stating that the Inhumans have lost much. They are in a period of healing. They have just begun to fortify their future and his people deserve safety as they mend. And they must be his sole concern. He can afford no other, but at that moment, there's a rumble and a thunderous THOOM as the portal opens back up. Doom crawling out, smoldering and on fire as he tries to stand up. Iron Man looks at him, telling him that it's not like him to be caught off guard. He wouldn't have gone in there if he didn't think he could win, but his armor's at a near catastrophic failure. Spider-Man looks at him. Come on, don't leave us waiting. What did you see? Doom informs them that what he saw is the pulverized metropolis of madness, where no mere mortal has sanely walked. Where the face of chaos first met Latveria's unflinching resolve is for Doom's eyes alone. Cthon made a mistake by letting him live. To consider. Victorious will remain to keep his word and aid them, but they will fall. And if they live to crawl back to his feet, as Cthulhu breaches Earth's shores, he will find Doom waiting. After a short banter with Victorious about her master's methods, the heroes realize what they must do, and they all peer into the book, into a world that could have been. And after just a brief moment, they all stop. Spider-Man looks around at everyone as they examine themselves, asking how they're feeling. He was expecting, but before he could finish, all five heroes begin to feel something taking over, transforming them into something else. Spider-Man looks at his new form. Ha! <laughs> that was a wild trip, right? New memories, new bodies, new moves, and a fun new point of view. Scarlet Witch tells Victorious to get behind her. It's too much. They've read too far. Spider-Man asks, what did you think would happen? What about mere madness inspires self-restraint? You wanted the Darkhold Defenders? Sure. But you're about to get Darkhold defiled. The way the Darkhold story unfolds, we now get to see what each of our heroes saw about their alternate universes, their dark universes. We're going to begin with the story of Dark Iron Man. It was a dark and stormy night at Stark Industries as Pepper and Happy heard something in one of the offices. It was at a time where Tony was missing, so they weren't taking any chances and decided to investigate themselves. But what they found was Tony in a suit of armor. Pepper and Happy helped him get out of the suit, but he explained that the chest piece needs to stay. There's shrapnel by his heart, and the chest piece's electromagnets are stopping it from getting any closer. The machine is keeping him alive. Pepper tells him that they need to get him to a hospital, but Tony tells her not to be ridiculous. It's a few burns, abrasions, soft tissue injuries, significant bruising. It looks like organ hematomas. But if he can make a suit that can keep him alive like this, just think about what he can do now that he is back. They can save the world! So for weeks, Tony and Pepper worked on improvements to Tony's design, installing regenerators into the suit to help repair damaged tissue. When Tony removed his helmet, his skin was near perfect, showing no signs that he was ever hurt. Next to his arm, he was wearing gauntlets, which helped improve his functionality. And as Pepper removed it to see what was beneath all of this, his skin came with it. He was attached to the glove. He put the glove back on and told everyone that the anesthetics are working. They need to work out a few bugs. More time went by and Tony and Pepper began to make great progress in their findings, as well as finding their own interests in one another. But before they could pursue one another, they needed to get Tony out of the suit, the suit that was melding with his flesh. One Sunday morning after working all night, Tony wanted to show Pepper his progress, but there was, there was something just odd about it. He was wearing the suit when he was supposed to be removing it. Pepper asked why he was still wearing it, and for a moment, Tony didn't even realize he was. 
His hands stopped hurting, but his legs and head still hurt. He knows he did it, but he didn't even notice. It was like scratching his nose. He just did it. Isn't that strange? Pepper ran over to the computer to scan the suit to find things that were even more disturbing. Tony's skin was gone. It was dissolved into the armor. She declared that they need to figure out how to replace it and get him out of the suit. But Tony stops her, telling her that he is concerned. But why would he ever remove the suit? She stops telling him that he can't be serious, but Tony tells her it's just a joke. The suit may have taken his skin, but it hasn't taken his trademark sense of humor. All he needs right now is something to eat. Maybe something with more regenerative properties. How about she and Jarvis go whip him something up? Pepper and Jarvis leave, but as they return, Tony activates the isolation protocol, locking himself in the lab. Pepper runs over to the computer to see what is going on, and what she finds is whatever is happening to Tony's body inside of the suit is accelerating. There are wires from the suit deep inside of his brain. His skull is gone, and he'll never be able to leave the suit again. All she can see is the undifferentiated meat. Pepper tells him all of this in a calm, unflinching voice, and Tony tells her that it sounds fine to him. An iron skull is better, isn't it? Safer. Stronger. As Tony's fluids leak out of the suit, he walks away, stating that he needs to fix it. Time to get to work. After that, he puts the entire building into lockdown. No one in or out, and after some time, the lock just, well, unlocks. He says that human bodies are flawed designs from top to bottom, aren't they? Bones that break, organs that fail, every cell division a chance for cancer. He can do better. Nobody has to suffer. He can protect everyone. As Happy and Jarvis step into the lab, it shuts again, shutting them inside. The room fills with gas before Pepper can even get to the terminal. Tony is already loading Happy and Jarvis into suits. She can hear their bones snapping. She can see what was inside of them gushing out through every crease in the suit. She waited for something, anything, and then they started to move, shuffling away behind Tony and begin helping him. Soon outside, Tony operates a suit, telling everyone that he could save the world. All they need to do is get into these suits. Pepper breaks a window, shouting for them not to do it. But if anything, people climb in even faster. As soon as the first screams begin, it's followed by another and another. Pepper tried to do all she could to warn people not to get in, but soon realized that there was one more that Tony wanted to put into a suit. Her. It was that night that Virginia Pepper Potts died and a suit was born. Now we look at what Blade saw when he saw his dark alternate reality. New York. V2K. For those who are unaware, that is Caledarium Vampire Year 2. Two years after everyone in the world became vampires. One night, Amadeus Cho was being chased by a group of vampires, all taunting him and asking that they thought that he was supposed to be a good vampire. Just come back. They won't tell Fisk that he ran away. But as Amadeus turns down an alleyway, the vampires follow him, running into Blade. Without question, Blade begins to kill the group until there is only one left. And the young boy yells to wait. He's a familiar. Smell his blood. He's still human. Blade looks down and smiles. Good. And kills him. He then turns back, calling out to Amadeus, but before Amadeus could respond, he's pulled into the shadows, narrowly evading Blade. A short while later, Amadeus is sitting at a table explaining that after V-Day, Fisk convinced him to build tech in exchange for blood. He didn't ask questions, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out what he was working on. Blade hunts, it's who he is, and Fisk lets him. The boogeyman is good for business, indentured servitude for protection. There was a balance, and then something changed. And word is, Blade is not your friendly neighborhood vampire hunter anymore. Not that he was cuddly to begin with. A serum that is supposed to keep him from going full blood guzzler began to run low. A medicine that isn't a priority for a vampire society. Another theory is that maybe Lamarga did find a host with all the strengths and only one weakness humanity. You see, Fisk was developing the only weapon that could make the whole world bow down and take Blade off the board for good. Fisk made a cure for vampirism, encrypted by him. And that's the only reason Blade's not here killing all of them right now. A voice says that if this cure exists, it could give them back the world. He will get them into Fisk's lair, and if Blade should follow friend or foe, Blade will face the last Avengers. 
and this team of Avengers consists of Citizen V, Silver Sable, and Prowler. The plan was set. Amadeus would return to Fisk Tower to occupy Fisk while the last Avengers snuck in through the decommissioned elevator shaft. But Fisk is a smart man, and as they entered the shaft, the vampires followed closely behind. Sable jumped off a wall starting to shoot, telling the others to keep going, and Prowler asked what is she doing? She tells him the job, right to the very end. Now go! Meanwhile in the penthouse, the fat, bloated Fisk sits in his bed asking, Is this a joke? Do you think? But gas begins to creep in through the vents, and there's a sudden taste of pennies in everyone's mouth. Amadeus quickly covers his nose with a wet rag, and Fisk begins to laugh, stating, Of course, airborne silver, how noble gassing them like rats. You finally have seen the light, Blade. Down the hall, Citizen V and Prowler run past the burning vampires, and Citizen V says, just a little further. Prowler slows down coughing, telling them that he's sorry. There's something in the air he can't. Citizen V tells him to hold his breath, but Prowler takes off his mask, showing his fangs. It's okay. I died a long time ago. Go find the cure. Back in the penthouse, Amadeus sees Blade walking towards him and asks if he can crack a window. This rag really isn't going to do much. But Blade senses something. Citizen V jumps out of the shadows swinging, and the sound of clashing metal rings out as the two deflect each other's blades. Blade knocks Citizen V to the ground, telling him, Good, you're human. But if you are human... Blade thrusts his sword into Citizen V's chest, pinning him down. What does the V stand for? Citizen V coughs. Wagner. My team's little joke about my accent. You knew me as Nightcrawler before the dark magics erased mutants. Again. Amadeus begins to sneak up behind, but Blade spins back, grabbing him by the throat. Amadeus struggles, yelling, Fight it! I know you have a hero inside of you! We can decrypt the cure together! Blade and Amadeus! Good vampires! Blade looks at Amadeus and tells him, I don't know what all of this is about, but there's no such thing as a good vampire. A second later, Blade throws Amadeus out the window watching him fall, talking out loud to himself that this world is already lost. It doesn't need protectors. It needs a king. So spread the word. From here on out, every last drop of blood in the city, in this world, belongs to King Blade. Our next story is what Wasp saw when she looked into her dark alternate reality. As Janet stares out the window, she sees a wasp nest stuck on a tree. She thinks to herself about how male wasps are utterly useless. Without the resources of the females, they can't offer anything. As Hank walks by, she notices that he isn't wearing his wedding ring, and she asks why. He says he can't because of work. It could be dangerous. He grabs a cup of coffee, asking if it was for him. Thanks. He needs to get back to work. Later, they received a report that Kang was attacking the museum, so the heroes quickly rushed to stop him. But after taking control over Iron Man's AI, Kang makes Iron Man attack Thor and Captain America to give him just enough time to steal the necklace that he was after. As he opens the display case, he feels a sting, and Janet flies by, asking, Didn't see that coming, did you? Kang says that her husband isn't here to hold her back by the wings, and Janet asks what is he talking about. He tells her that he can sense her resentment, her anger. She may be small, but her emotions are great. She is so free without Hank. She grows in size, punching Kang, telling him not to pretend that he knows anything about feelings. As Kang grabs the necklace, he says that she reminds him of a woman that he once loved. Her sorrow filled him with such delight because he knew that only he could take care of her. Is there someone taking care of her, though? As Kang steps into the portal, Janet is frozen by his words. Was someone taking care of her? Days would pass and she did what she could to be a loving wife, but no matter what she did, Hank always seemed irritated, like she was bothering him. She suggested that maybe they take a vacation, get away from all of the research and building and superheroing. But Hank tells her that they don't have time. He doesn't have time. Now leave him while he focuses. More time would pass, and it was more of the same thing. But one night, Janet and Hank were invited to a party at the Avengers Mansion in New York, which she thought would be a great way for them to get out for a bit. However, while everyone was mingling, she was busy drinking glass after glass of wine, so much that Pepper took notice. Pepper suggested that they do all the things that she already tried, that that was how marriage was. And at that moment, there was a comment that may have struck a chord. You should do something for yourself. Who else is going to take care of you? It reminded her of what Kang asked. Dear old Hank, always so self-important. If only she could control him. He's a tortured soul, not deserving of her. Why would she let this continue? 
Partnership requires reciprocation. With expectations already set so low, actions speak louder than words. So later, while waiting for the Avengers to make their decision, Hank bursts out of the room, and Janet runs over asking what happened. He yells to get away from him. The Avengers think that his behavior is too erratic since becoming Yellow Jacket, just because he used force on Elf Queen instead of trying to reason with her. They say that he's become a liability. They're going to make him stand court-martial. Janet, I'm afraid. Janet holds him, thinking to herself, I can do better. She's been dejected, neglected, controlled. Male wasps do not sting, enabling the females to dominate the males. So at night, Hank was up late working in the lab and Janet wanted to see him. She shrunk and flew into the lab and his robot said, Avenger detected. Hank lashes out asking if she's spying on him. She says that she's worried. What is he even building? What is this horrible thing? He yells that he was saving his career. Those friends of hers are giving him the boot. But with this, he can make all of them see. She tries to grab him, but Hank slaps her. And she falls hands first into a set of glass beakers. He steps back, telling her that he's sorry. He didn't know what came over him. And she looks at the cuts. She looks at the broken glass. And instead of feeling scared, she feels angry. She grabs the glass, using it to stab Hank over and over again. What happened to her dreams? How long was a woman meant to stand in the shadow of a man? Did he expect her to support him unconditionally forever? Is someone taking care of her? It's about time that she spread her wings. Because she doesn't need anyone. She can finally be free. Now we have a look at what Black Bolt saw in his alternate reality. Black Bolt felt a splitting headache as he woke up on a barren land trying to figure out what just happened. He has no memory of how he got there, just that he is on Taros. But how? Why? His throne sits empty. He must focus. Back on Atilian, he's approached by the royal physician Telegar. He has come with a warning. It's about his brother Maximus. He's planning a coup against Black Bolt's throne. Maximus has planned to take the throne himself and asked for assistance. But if he was warned, how did he end up on Taros? Was he betrayed? If so, how could he have stepped into a trap that he knew was... But before he could even ponder the situation further, he feels his feet give out as he slides down a pit, realizing that he just stepped into a sand slip. And when there's a slip sand, there's typically a desert kraken. As the desert kraken springs out of the ground, Black Bolt tries to get away, but the kraken grabs a hold of him with its tail and it gets ready to swallow him whole. If this is how he is going to die, forever buried in the sand as a forgotten meal of a monster, should he leave his throne, his home world, at the mercy of Maximus? Black Bolt uttered the words, no. A shockwave came forth and it ripped the desert kraken apart. As Black Bolt pulls himself out of the mess that was the Kraken, he sees the Mountain of Survivors, the sole supply point for the moon. He makes his way in hopes of finding supplies, but as he does, more of what happened returns to him. Telegar was explaining that Maximus was planning on using Attilian's advanced molecular surgery to change his appearance, to make him an exact copy of one of his ministers. Which one? Maximus didn't say. This, of course, caused distrust among the ministers. Has Maximus proceeded with his plan already? Was he one of the ones standing before Black Bolt, or maybe just the thought was his goal? Everyone would point fingers at each other. But then the Minister of Technology had an idea. They could install memory detectors throughout the palace. The detectors display random memories of all of those who approach. So if Maximus takes on the appearance of one of them, the memory detector will expose him. Black Bolt climbed the mountain as his memory was still coming to him in waves, hoping to find something that can help him return to Attilian. There was a self-burial shroud for the prisoners on the verge of death, and once sealed inside, it sent a location beacon to Attilian, letting the authorities know that you are ready for burial. Once sealed inside, you cannot open it. No, he can't use that. He would likely suffocate before anyone arrives. So Black Bolt sits and waits, and he waits, and he waits, when suddenly a shuttle can be seen in the distance. But it's no supply ship. It bears the princely insignia, which could only mean Maximus. Has he come to gloat, to ensure that Black Bolt has not escaped? There is only one way to know. The name Maximus is yelled from Black Bolt's lips, tearing the shuttle apart, causing it to come crashing down into the mountains. 
Black Bolt walks over to the ship asking himself if he did it. Has he saved Tillian? Could it have been that easy? As he opens up the hatch, he sees Telegar inside, barely alive. He coughs, informing the king that he failed him. But Black Bolt thinks no. It is he who has failed, if only he could speak. Telegar looks at Black Bolt and asks, does he not remember? He is not Black Bolt Boltagon. He is Maximus. Black Bolt yells in his mind, asking, how is this even possible? Is he mad? Is... Is he? Telegar coughs, stating that they planned this coup for a year. The plan wasn't for Maximus to become one of the ministers. It was to become Black Bolt himself, and the plan was flawless, except for the memory detectors. They had to implant false memories to simulate the memories of Blackagar. But unlike his brother, he hadn't spent a lifetime practicing silence, training his vocal cords, denying his instincts to cry out. With one shriek, he nearly brought down the laboratory. King Blackagar's security forces descended on the carnage, and Maximus was captured. Telegar tried to continue, but his words faded as he passed from his injuries, and Black Bolt placed Telegar in the burial shroud, awaiting for the shuttle to come, wondering if what Telegar had said was true. Could, could the plan the whole time not have been to steal his identity, but for him to question it? So that he could not resist his fate, so that he could let the coup proceed uncontested? Only one person knows for sure. He no longer knows whether he is himself or his brother. All he knows is that he is a Maximus, and he can never return. And if he is Blackagar, he cannot stay. Not knowing who he is or what to do, he takes the only option fate has afforded him, and wait. The last individual who looked into the book is Spider-Man. In a city full of web, Spider-Man gets a call from his wife, Gwen, telling him that she tried calling him three times. He tells her sorry. There was a thing at the High Line and, well, it kind of fell apart. Gwen tells him not to forget the cider vinegar for the Knishes and be home by 7.30. And if he's late, she'll show him what she used to do to spiders in the second grade. Now come on, say it. Spider-Man hangs up above the decrepit New York only held together by webbing and he sighs. Happy anniversary. Manhattan used to sound like the world tuning up, a blare of car horns, cursing and construction, and now all Spider-Man can hear is a cheerless wind and his own breathing. Before the unraveling, he'd only experienced that kind of silence once before, when Uncle Ben drove him to Rockaway Beach one icy Thanksgiving. No one knows how the unraveling happened. Nobody does. Reed says that it might have had something to do with the Molecule Man, and even then, Reed was guessing. All he knows is that one day, everything began to fall apart. Bridges, buildings, and even people. And that's when the old webbing came in handy. The only trouble was it didn't last. So every day, he has to go around the city of New York, spinning more webbing, putting things back together, including people. Spider-Man hears a man call to him and sees his jaw and arm are missing. The man groans and Spider-Man says, Wow! Otto tried to take you hostage again? You must be giving off some serious hostage vibes. Down the sidewalk, Spider-Man sees the man's jaw, webbing it over, telling him, okay, at least here's this. Just give me a moment to go speak to Otto about your missing arm. Over on the bridge, Doc Ock is waving the man's arm, yelling to Spider-Man that everything they have done led up to this moment, their final duel. Now face me or this innocent man dies. Spider-Man begins to web up the mechanical arms, telling Otto to relax. If he starts straining, he'll... But a second later, the mechanical arms pop out of the webbing, keeping them attached. Otto begins to cry, asking, please, don't laugh. Spider-Man tells him, you know I won't, Otto. He's not going to today, he won't tomorrow, or the day after that. I promise, Otto. Just then, there's an explosion at the Baxter building as a flaming force shines above. Spider-Man sighs, stating that he doesn't really need to do that. Moments later, as Spider-Man crawls into Reed's lab, he yells that he does have a phone. He doesn't need to use the flare. Oh my god! On the ground is what could only be described as a puddle of a human. And Reed says, Sorry, I can only imagine how disconcerting this must be. I recently discovered that by abandoning human morphology, it frees up significant cognitive capacity for, uh, my work. So Reed pulls himself together, and Spider-Man asks if they can just move this along. He has dinner with Gwen later. Reed asks him why, and Spider-Man says because she's his wife. And Reed says, well, yes, technically that is the case, but 
It doesn't explain why you keep indulging in this inane anniversary meal fantasy. Your responsibility to the city end. Spider-Man stops and yells, I get to sleep maybe three hours a night, and last time I checked, I only weigh 120 pounds. Every day I wake up and I knit this hopeless city back together all by myself. Then my webbing dissolves and I do it all over again. Meanwhile, the great Reed Richards is down here being an extensionally confusing glop. Don't talk to me about responsibility. Reed tells him that this is what he wanted to talk about. Please come this way. As Spider-Man follows, he sees a sonic gun out and he says, Wait, wait, wouldn't that mean? Reed ignores him, telling him that his webbing degrades over approximately three hours, right? He has been working on a self-healing organic polymer that could theoretically replace his web fluid. He's applied this special enzyme to make it adhesive. Spider-Man pulls on the blue elastic polymer, asking what is it? And Reed holds out his hand, telling him that it was his finger. There are others out there that were saved by their elastic molecular structure. Bring them here and this enzyme could solve all of our webbing problems. You'd finally get to rest. Spider-Man says that he knows why the Sonic Gun's here. He's in New York, isn't he? Venom is here. Spider-Man takes the gun and heads into the sewers, and within seconds, Venom attacks, nearly cutting off Spider-Man's head, destroying the gun in the process. Venom begins to wrap himself around Spider-Man to absorb him, but Spider-Man webs up the ceiling and pulls, causing a small cave-in on Venom. Venom calls out to Spider-Man, but Spider-Man punches him, telling him, SHUT IT AND GIVE ME YOUR SUIT! This is bigger than the two of us, Eddie. Venom pulls back the mask to show a dead Eddie. Eddie is gone. Tried to keep him fresh. Why, why didn't you just leave Venom? Couldn't. Two wounds, bowed and broken at the same altar. But we healed each other. Eddie wasn't my host. Eddie was my home. I'm, I'm sorry, Venom. I, I can be that for you. I wasn't ready before, but now. Venom reaches back and then pulls back again. No. Why? But then he remembers something. Gwen. And he's late to their anniversary dinner. He rushes through the city to his apartment, yelling to Gwen, Hey, I didn't forget, except I did. He looks at the undead Gwen and blows out the candle, telling her that he forgot the cider vinegar. A short while later at the Baxter building, Spider-Man jumps in and Reed asks if there were any complications, and Spider-Man tells him none worth mentioning. Reed continues his research and says that they should talk about Gwen, but Spider-Man ignores him. Two wounds we are. Reed goes on telling him that he spoke out of turn and he'd like to apologize. It was wrong of him to imply that his priorities aren't reasonable or considered. But Spider-Man doesn't say a word and instead he grabs a syringe. The next day, Spider-Man goes out to repair the city like he normally does, but this time with something a little different. It isn't just his webbing, it's laced with black and blue fibers. And as Spider-Man finally takes a moment to relax, he can hear Reed's voice. Please, it hurts. Spider-Man tells him he knows. But Reed, you have a responsibility to the city. And now we go to the other end. We go to discover what the Dark Avengers did once they became the Dark Avengers. Did they stop Cthulhu? This is Darkhold Omega. With the portal to the other realm opening at the hands of Doom, the Scarlet Witch begins to put together a team to fight back the evil forces before they invade the world. The Scarlet Witch's plan to tempt Iron Man, Spider-Man, Black Bolt, Wasp, and Blade from the madness backfired when they read the Darkhold, resulting in them not becoming the Darkhold Defenders, but the Darkhold Defiled. She casts a barrier telling them to fight it, but Spider-Man jumps onto the shield asking, You really wanted us to read it. You're the one who did this to us. Now you got buyer's remorse? She throws the Darkhold to Victorious, telling her to get the book to doom while she focuses on keeping the Defiled busy. As the barrier breaks, Scarlet Witch binds everyone, telling them, If you want blood, then take it from Cthulhu! With everyone in position, she turns back to the machine that Doom used to open up the portal, activating it, banishing the five defiled into the other realm. As they're thrown on the other side, Spider-Man asks if anyone else is feeling a bit vengeful after being tricked by a magical trap door. Iron Man tells him, Forget the witch. This realm could be ours. We just have to do better than these losers, the first Darkhold Defenders. Just then an arm reaches out through the ground, grabbing him as the rest of the original defenders pull themselves out of the sands. Wasp blasts one apart, telling them, A little massacre, a little mutilation, with Cthulhu's army as the main course! If we want the king to show his face, we're gonna have to tear up his toys. Blade rips into the army, asking, What? Are we doing what the witch wanted now? And Wasp tells him no. 
Cthune wrote the Book of Madness, and once he's dead, what they do with the Other Realm will be five times worse. Wave after wave of the monsters descend upon the defiled, and just as they said, wave after wave are cut down and dismembered and torn apart. As they stand on the mound of bodies, Spider-Man yells, asking, What is this? What's with the disrespect, big guy? We're here and barely winded, and you're hiding? Just then, there's a rumble that breaks the ground, and a giant hand reaches up, grabbing all five of the defiled. As Cthune begins to close his hand, Wasp grows to hold him back from crushing them, and then there's a bright blue light that shoots by. The light suddenly stops in Cthune's grasp, and then it explodes, injuring Wasp, but also destroying Cthune's hand. As the man floats before them, Iron Man scans him and says, He's getting biospheric energy. There's no other source of it here. He's from the outside, like us. So Blade lunges at him, like hell, this is our slaughter. But the man easily blasts Blade away. Spider-Man yells to the man, telling them, hey, we just murdered an army. Guess what we're gonna do to you? But at that moment, the ground shakes again and Cthune says that their madness is inevitable, but their victory is small. Though his legion lay slaughtered by their hands, with a heart pounding like night thunder, Cthune yet lives. The quiet man kneels before Cthune and Cthune passes him. You are spent, observer. He walks to the portal, and even though he mourns his legion, there's more than enough might left in this horrid flesh to corrupt the earth in tribute. As he pushes into the portal, something pushes back, and he yells, I must pass. The raw mortal world is mine to defile. This is my moment. He's then knocked away as a voice tells him, No, as it only ever could be, the world belongs to doom. Cthune stands, beginning to laugh, telling him, I do not need an army to cut down a tin-plated pedant and a fragile vessel. Doom holds up the dark hole, telling him that his arrogance is the key to his undoing. He then bursts out laughing again. You could hardly glance at the true dark hold without going mad, and you dare taunt me with my own creation. I wrote the damn book! As Cthune begins to split apart into a larger creature, Scarlet Witch and Doom combine their powers to keep Cthune at bay, and Scarlet Witch says that the true Darkhold can't be destroyed, and neither can he. So Doom says that the Earth was once his, and like all old ideas, he is prey to evolution. And here, now, Doom alone predates. I have read the book, and I will embody it. I alone will bind and seal your revenge. But before Doom could, Scarlet Witch tells him that it isn't his revenge. A pillar of flame engulfs Doom, and Scarlet Witch grabs the book, yelling that after everything Cthune has done to her, revenge will be hers. Cthune shouts that she is nothing but what he allows, as it always has been. But Scarlet Witch tells him that that's the past, and he should worry about the now. Cthune asks, with what power? You have none. She tells him, perhaps... But his book does, and now it's every fiber, every ink drop exists within her, the Scarlet Witch. As the Darkhold merges with her, Scarlet Witch says that now she is the true Darkhold. He haunted her for so long, but in the end, he does not possess her. She possesses him. She begins to transform, growing the same horns that Cthune has. But soon, Cthune is gone. Iron Man tells her, I'm not getting any readings of Cthune. And Spider-Man tells him, The witch just ate the guy and took his power for herself! Wasp then yells that Maximoff just dropped them here like trash, wants to stop them from taking their pound of flesh. And she calmly says the true Darkhold is now bound to her soul, along with its author. Kill her, and Cthune will be free. Cthune is chained there, in the dark, but after decades of mastering her plan, she is more than ready for him. As for them, are you defiled, ready to go home? A few moments later, the portal back to Abysmia opens up and the five heroes return, returning back to their former selves. Wasp says that Wanda did it, didn't she? And Scarlet Witch says that she rewrote its influence over them. At Black Bolt's request, she left flashes of their lives gone wrong to remind them of what could have been. Spider-Man asks if she thinks that he needs reminders that he's a screw-up. I got roommates. But later that night in New York at the old castle, Scarlet Witch is calling to meet with Doom about her betrayal. With a wave of her finger, he asks why she set him on fire, and Scarlet Witch tells him that she knew his plan the whole time. And with a wave of her finger, Doom's body floats in the air and begins to be violently twisted and torn apart. As the Doombot falls to the ground, Scarlet Witch sighs. Your ego is one of your few weaknesses. You couldn't even be here yourself. I know you're watching. 
and you can think what you like. But you cannot threaten me any longer, Doom. Our feud is locked up away with the past. It's a darkness I will always carry, and I will never let it control me. This is a new page one, and from now on, I'm free. And there you have it, the story of Darkhold. I want to know what you think about this whole series, because it honestly felt like Marvel wanted to do their own version of the Dark Multiverse, but they wanted to wrap it into a storyline, which is what I felt DC was trying to do with the Dark Multiverse, but it never ended up happening. I kind of like the idea of the Darkhold Defilers, and I kind of wish that we would get something more with them, but it's a cool kind of one-off thing that happened and no one really knew happened. It came out during Halloween 2021, and just kind of under the radar just kind of flew by, so... Take it for what you will. I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. And I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Now, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to know when our next video comes out. And the next long-form video will be out next Monday. So check back if you just want to go that route. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.